As David said, I'm a general paediatrician in the Kimberley. For those of you like me who's mostly trained on the eastern seaboard, that's the most northern part of WA. Uh, it's an area about twice the size of Victoria, and we look after a patient population of about 40,000 people. So when I get a phone call from someone in the middle of the night, one of the first things to clarify is whether they're down the road in our Broome Hospital or whether they're a 1,000 kilometres away. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Yugara people of, uh, who are the traditional owners of the land on which we're standing at the moment uh, and the elders past, present and future and the 30 different language groups that I work with in the Kimberley. Now, scabies <laughs> is not a socially acceptable topic. When I've been asked what I've been working on, sometimes I have to sort of look around the cafe and see how close people are sitting before I acknowledge out loud what it is that I've been talking about. Culturally, we see it as this huge alien threat. The hip-hop artist George Watsky rapped about something will kill us, maybe AIDS or scabies or rabies or zombie babies. It's up there <laughs> as a big threat. <laughs> The contrary view amongst many clinicians like myself, if you don't see it very much, is that scabies is just a bit of a nuisance. It's around, maybe a bit of an itch, doesn't actually cause that many problems, a little bit like head lice, which is also a giant threat or nothing at all. But scabies affects the most vulnerable in our society. It's a disease of poverty, it affects elderly people and it affects children. And we'll come back to that later. But in terms of more ability, Scabies is actually pretty significant. It, um, at any one point in the world, there's probably about 100 million people who are infected with scabies. It's in the top 50 infectious diseases in the world. In terms of disability-adjusted life years, it has an impact uh, greater than dengue fever. Um, that's related to sleep disturbance, loss of productivity. Um, and of course, it also has an impact on um, impetigo. Oh, sorry, let me work this. Um, particularly uh, so bacterial skin infections that gain access through the scabies portal. So particularly streptogenes and Staphylococcus aureus, which if they become invasive, have significant mortality rates. Um, there's also downstream effects such as post-strep GN, which is another disease that I really didn't see much of until I moved to the Kimberley or to Northern Australia. And um, that probably we're establishing more and more does have a long-term effect in terms of chronic renal disease, early need for dialysis and early death. Rheumatic fever is also on the list. Traditionally, it's felt to be related to streptogenes in the throat rather than the skin, but probably there is some link that we may elucidate uh, in the next couple of decades, and uh, Josh is going to speak to us about rheumatic fever soon. In terms of prevalence, Australia has some of the highest rates in the world. This is overall prevalence. If you just look at children, it's even higher. The highest rates have been seen in Papua New Guinea, where about 74% of children in certain communities were found to be affected by scabies. And as you can see, it gravitates to tropical regions and usually poorly resourced regions. So what's actually happening with this lovely beast? <laughs> it once someone's infected by a mite, it digs a burrow into the stratum corneum, um, poos, which sets up a bit of an inflammatory reaction, and lays eggs. Interestingly, there's not much of an immediate itch response in first infection. It happens down the track, usually about four to six weeks down the track. And I don't think anyone understands immunology apart from immunologists, <laughs> myself included. Um, but we, we do know that there tends to be the simple scabies, which is uh, probably about 10 or 15, maybe some more mites on the, on the single person versus crusted scabies, which is a hyper infestation with hyperkeratosis and thousands and thousands of mites. People with crusted scabies act as a reservoir for infection for other people, which is a really important thing to identify because they can be the ones passing it around the community. We know that people with crusted scabies are often those who are immunosuppressed, so people with HIV, HTLV, diabetes on steroids. But there probably is an effect of the scabies itself that leads to a degree of immunosuppression, hence the delayed immune response. 
So there's difference in cytokine expression profiles, there are different differences in T cell helper, pro helper T cell profiles in the skin between sc crusted scabies and simple scabies, partially which may be triggered by the scabies mite itself. We also know through Queensland research that there are changes in the microbiome of the skin in pig models uh, where scabies is present. So particular transition to more pathogenic species. The corollary, corollary of which in, um, in people is streptopyogenes and Staph aureus. So we change from a more non-pathogenic microbiome to a more pathogenic microbiome which then sets up uh, for progression into infotigo and all the downstream effects. So now I've got some pretty rash pictures, which I freaked out my seatmate on the plane with here. <laughs> um, so traditional areas to look for scabies are in the finger webs, toe webs, wrists, groin, and around the abdomen. We often see soles of the feet and palms of the hands in young babies. But scabies is also known as a great mimicker and it can look like other dermatoses, um, and particularly if you don't go looking for it, you might not find it. This obviously is an adult, um, and that's quite a subtle skin finding that if you didn't look at their feet, would be very, very easy to miss. So how good are we at finding skin lesions and scabies? This is research done in my own hospital and in Port Hedland by two of my previous registrars, where essentially they looked at a prospective case or chart review looked for documentation of any skin lesions or scabies and then prospectively examined kids in a similar time of year to look at how many um, kids were identified as having skin problems. And if you look at these top two um, lines of the table there, essentially there was a big difference between when we went actively looking for skin lesions and when we were just notice, noticing it incidentally. And so these are all kids who are admitted with every diagnosis, whether someone looked at their skin or not. So they found four times the amount of skin lesions when they're actively looking than they did with just general routine admission. Now, somebody might be tempted to say, I was on maternity leave when that happened. <laughs> Um, if I was there in our little small hospital, of course, I would have been looking. Um, but I think what this indicates is that we're normalising skin infections in lots of kids. We have other priorities. We're treating their gastro, we're treating their pneumonia, um, and we're not necessarily thinking broadly and actually going looking at opportunistically for the skin infections when they're present. Part of the issue is that we don't have clear diagnostic criteria. So I've been involved in this study, which I'll take you through the table in a minute. Um, essentially, we looked at th 71 therapeutic trials for scabies, not looking for the therapeutic outcome, but looking for um, what diagnostic criteria they used to say, well, this patient has scabies. And if you trialling a therapy, you thought, you'd thought you think you'd sort of have to have a fairly rigorous case um, definitions for inclusions. Um, so most people looked at a clinical examination with, or itch or other features, rash, rash distribution, contact history. Unfortunately, 44% of all trials didn't tell us what that was. So it was amazing the number of trials that said, we enrolled patients with scabies, full stop which if you're comparing across trials and therapeutic interventions is pretty difficult to then um, accurately make a comparison. The uh, other diagnostic feature that is often quoted is the use of skin scrapings, but that is very dependent on finding the right area of the body, having the right technique, using the right material to look under the microscope with, and it is very, very prone to false negatives. It's not a great field test. Uh, only 32% of these trials actually required a positive test, such as a skin scraping, to diagnose scabies. And between the two, a quarter of all trials had absolutely no information on what diagnostic criteria they were used. So it's impossible to, com to compare. The dermatologists are potentially leading the way in terms of what we can do at the bedside looking for scabies in terms of confirmation. <coughs> Um, those of you who are GPs may be familiar with the dermatoscope, which is essentially a handheld microscopic device. 
um, that allows you to look at the skin usually used, used in skin cancer. Those of us who are hospitalists probably haven't had much exposure to that. But dermatoscopy has great potential in terms of confirming scabies diagnosis at the bedside. So these, this triangular shape on the right, oh, right hand here is the mouth part of the scabies mite and the sort of ovoid shape behind it is the actual mite itself. And all of these little ovals along here are the eggs with a stereotypical S-shaped burrow. So dermatoscopy may be the way of the future for those of us who are working in remote clinics to be able to actually confirm yes or no, uh, this is scabies or not, which may be particularly useful if you're looking at a post-treatment scenario to tell whether there are still mites present or whether it's just an inflammatory itchy response. In terms of treatments, we've got a few options. We've got mostly topical options. Um, BBE or benzoyl benzoate are used a bit overseas. Uh, Urex is used for young children and likely is, or permethrin is our standard treatment. All of these require essentially slathering the whole body in a topical preparation, leaving it on for several hours and then washing it off again, which is not very pleasant for anybody to do and is much better done, actually much more effective if it's a directly observed therapy. But that has its own issues of directly observing someone slather their whole body <laughs> in a treatment. It's also not very pleasant for the top tropics. We also have ivermectin, which is an oral tablet, which has much better uptake um, and is much more practical. However, it has limitations in terms of use in pregnancy, breastfeeding, and in children under 15 kilos, which is one of our primary populations that we're trying to target. There's a small concern about neurotoxicity in those young children, which is why it's not used. And we're also starting to become concerned about potential ivermectin resistance. All of these treatments require a repeat in seven days. So if you want to actually interact the life cycle of the mite, these are all killing off live mites. They're not killing off the eggs that are about to hatch. And so if you don't do that follow-up treatment in seven days, you're not actually going to interrupt the life cycle and have effective eradication for that patient. Having said that, we do okay in terms of treating an index case. So this is a study from the Territory which looks at uptake of treatment in index cases. They were using topical permethrin. Unfortunately, we also need to treat the household contacts because usually it's spread around the household. You can treat the kids, send them home, and they just get reinfected from their brother or sister. Contacts, we didn't do so well in terms of uptake of treatment. So the dark grey bar bars on the right there uh, uptake of treatment by contacts. So where's clinicians go, oh yes, your child has scabies, have a few tubes of likely to take it home and treat the whole family, but uh, that only about 30 to 40% of that family will actually get treatment. So you're not interrupting the transmission cycle. So we have a disease that we don't clearly know how to diagnose. We don't have good tests. We have treatments that have poor adherence and are not very pleasant to take. Um, and we're not very good at treating contacts. So how are we actually going to intervene to make any sort of difference in reducing this burden of scabies? Well, so this alliance, which we can join for free at this website, um, has been meeting for about five years to talk about how we can get scabies on the international stage and how we can improve treatment, diagnosis, and research around this. Uh, so IACS has been um, leaders in um, advocacy internationally uh, and there's currently what's called a Delphi process which is essentially an inter international vote amongst experts to develop consensus statement about what diagnostic guidelines are appropriate. If we can get diagnostic guidelines at least we'll all be speaking the same language, we can compare research and that can be the basis for ongoing development. One of the victories of IACS is that Scabies has been recognised as a neglected tropical disease by the World Health Organisation earlier this year, which is fantastic because this is what a lot of the international funding bodies use and this is where um, the agenda gets set. So this is a big step that will allow us to progress the research. 
A number of other diseases have had effective treatment through the use of mass drug administration, which is essentially where you go around the community and you treat every single person, whether they're symptomatic or not, for a particular disease. Lymphatic filariasis has had good success. Onchocerciasis has had good success. This is a bit more controversial in Australia, partly because scabies is still perceived as a nuisance disease, partly because it can be seen to be patronising to say to everybody, oh, you need to take this tablet and we're going to stand there and watch you. But there is some evidence that mass drug administration for scabies is effective. So using both permethrin or ivermectin, they have shown good reductions in prevalence in Panama, Solomon Islands, Northern Territory and in Fiji. However, ongoing case management, case detection and that second dose seven days later have been critical issues in terms of sustaining that difference. And all of these communities are fairly small island communities, which makes it difficult to translate to places like desert communities or communities where there's a lot of transition between different places, because how wide do you spread your net in terms of your population? Those of you who are pet owners might be familiar with moxidectin. This is one of the potential new advances in, um, in scabies treatment as well. It's been used in the veterinary space for quite a while. Um, moxidectin is an avermectin that is, um, has a very long half-life, about 20 to 30 days. And so it gets over that issue of needing to provide that second dose. This is in preclinical assessments. It's not yet had human trials that have been of any great size. Um, but hopefully this might be an, an advance that allow us to, allows us to A, treat our index cases, B, um, treat our contacts and potentially look at mass drug administration in a much more practical manner. That research has been done here in Queensland. And a lot of it's about raising a, awareness. So amongst communities, we need to denormalise skin sores. We need to have families be happy talking about skin health. Safe skin is a phrase that we often use rather than clean skin. Um, so that when there is an issue, it's not just, oh, that kid's got another boil, it's that they actually get brought into clinic and they can have an opportunity for treatment. We need to look at the social determinants of health, nutrition, vaccination. Hopefully we've got a group A strep vaccine somewhere on the cards in the next couple of decades. Housing and overcrowding, which is a key factor in transmission of skin sores and scabies, and general health efforts, which means we need culturally appropriate, culturally safe care that people can feel comfortable coming in and seeking health advice and health treatment. So we've got a very, very long way to go with scabies. Hopefully we're actually getting our definitions right, so we can all be speaking the same language and then be moving forward to reduce the burden. And I'm hopeful that one day I won't walk into work and find a ward board that looks like this, because hopefully the PSGN component, and perhaps even the mastoiditis component, might be reduced to the history books at some point. It's certainly not yet in Australia, but there are some hopes that we might get there. Thank you. <laughs>